Hello ladies and gents, and welcome to the Repair Lair. I've been getting quite a few comments on some of my videos lately, particularly the one about swapping the housing of a PSP 3000, where people say they're getting put off from doing it themselves as the process looks very difficult. And that's a shame, because with the videos that I make, I hope to inspire everybody to not be afraid of fixing, repairing and modifying your devices. Be it a leaky coffee machine, a dead battery on your electric toothbrush, or a washing machine that doesn't drain, you don't need to be an expert to sort out many things around the house yourself. All it takes is a bit of patience and a vague understanding about how the item in question works. Also helps if you have a good selection of curse words at your disposal. Now to try and prove my point, I'm making this video about something I haven't exactly done before. Today I'll show you how I took a bag of parts from a botched repair job and, with a bit of nasty hackery, managed to put it all back together into a working PlayStation Vita console. All while also commenting about my thoughts during the entire process. Hopefully this will help convince you that repairs that look complex aren't necessarily so. A quick note though, don't expect this to be a tutorial about repairing PS Vitas. That's not the goal here. But if you do have one, you might find some useful information in this video. Additionally, I'm not a professional and I do repairs simply because I enjoy fixing things. So please take all of my suggestions made in this video with a grain of salt. And with all that boring preface finally out of the way, let's get started. So here's the bag that I mentioned in the intro, which should theoretically contain all of the parts of a PS Vita 1000. I've received this from a friend. I've been told he tried to replace the analog sticks and couldn't get them to fit properly. But the console should otherwise be in a fully working condition. We've got lots of things in the bag, including... Four PS Vita 2000 joysticks? Well, I think that might give us a clue as to what has happened here. The good news is that it seems we have all of the important bits still in the bag. The back panel, with the battery, all the PCBs, and the screen. The screen seems to have a couple of scratches, but it's in an okay shape otherwise. We seem to have one analog stick missing, and the other one has this weird felt pad stuck on it. Presumably it was put on there because the original rubber grip has fallen off. And while looking through the parts container, I also didn't manage to find the original left analog stick assembly. Only these shaft parts. Taking a closer look at the bag, I was really sure that these are the wrong analog sticks, which can only be used on a PS Vita 2000. Now, to give you a full disclaimer here, I did go through the contents of this bag before filming the video, and I have therefore preemptively ordered two new analog sticks, specifically for the PS Vita 1000. Looking closer, you can see how the 1000 variant differs from the 2000 version. The newer Vita sticks have four little alignment pins that stick out from the case, while the other version only has two. Additionally, the older version has a different cable with five copper contacts, while the new one only has four, and the color is different. What I think happened here was that the owner of this console tried buying some new analog sticks, and the seller simply sent the wrong ones, potentially twice in a row. This isn't actually too surprising, because the correct analog sticks for the PS Vita 1000 are for some reason much harder to come by online. The plan now is to replace both the missing and the worn analog sticks with these new parts that I bought, so let's get to it. Firstly, we need to remove the action keys PCB. To disconnect these types of ribbon cables that have sockets with locking tabs, you need to lift up the tabs, then gently pull the cables out. There's really no wrong way of unlocking these connectors, as long as you don't use too much force. You can even use your fingers instead of tweezers. Once the cables are disconnected, the PCB is gently pulled out from the mighty grasp of the retaining clips. Removing the old analog stick is a piece of cake. It's just held on by two screws. If you're doing something similar, keep in mind that disassembling a device gives you great access to cleaning out places that are hard to reach otherwise. I like to use car dash and trim cleaner for plastic and rubber parts. With the PCB and analog stick removed, it's trivial to pop out all of the buttons and clean all the nasty dirt around these parts.
Now, as I said in the introduction, you don't need to be an expert to repair many small electronics and other devices. It is, however, a common and quite innocent mistake people make in that they somehow order the wrong parts or perhaps like here get sent the wrong parts and they're not able to tell the difference. Anyway, if you take anything away from this video, I hope it's the following. Make sure to always check that the part that you've ordered actually matches what you are replacing. Seriously, it may sound silly, but because ordering what you need might seem like a trivial task, it's not uncommon to order the wrong stuff due to complacency, especially when parts look similar. When in doubt, just check the fit. Nine times out of ten, if the parts are not identical, the new one will not fit neatly into place. Case in point, disregarding the electrical wiring not being identical, trying to fit a PS Vita 2000 joystick into a PS Vita 1000 just doesn't work. Because it has those extra pins as I've just shown, it does not fit nicely into position. It just wobbles around instead. Just to be completely clear here, I'm not trying to make fun of people not being able to fit the right part in the right place. Quite the contrary, it's totally understandable that if you have not done anything similar in the past and it's your first time dismantling some complex piece of electronics, you will be way out of your comfort zone. And there's nothing wrong with that. You might want to just drop everything and give up, which is likely what happened here in this case, or seek professional help. But actually, most of the time is what you need to do is to stop and investigate what's happening. And as long as you don't use excessive force and don't connect things backwards, it'll be fine. Now you can see that the correct part fits perfectly. I mean, obviously it does. I know I ordered the right thing. But you can see what a massive difference it makes. The bottom part of the joystick sits nice and flush and it doesn't wobble. And really, I'd guess that about 90% of all electronics repairs done in the world are not much different to this. It typically just involves replacing some defective components. Here you can see me repeat most of the process with the other side too. I clean everything up and install another new analog stick. And now that that's done, we can start reassembling the device. The first part to go back is the Action Keys PCB. And while handling it, the cable looked as if it wasn't seated quite properly. To be safe, I removed the cable and also cleaned off the contacts before reinserting it back in. The best tool to use for cleaning copper contacts is a fiberglass brush. It's soft and gentle on the contacts and gets rid of all dirt and oxidation extremely effectively. While inserting this PCB, I saw two plastic clips that are meant to hold it in place. I put the PCB back, reconnected some of the cables and tried screwing it down. But then noticed that I couldn't quite get the board to sit properly. What happened here was, I missed a third plastic retainer that's right under the shoulder button frame. Not a problem though, as I didn't use any excessive force, no permanent damage was done. This is definitely something to keep in mind, if you feel like you need to use more force than you should, you're likely doing something wrong. Once I figured out my mistake, putting the board back and screwing it down was completely straightforward. Reconnecting these cables is trivial. You just need to make sure the locking tab is up and then angle the cable correctly, slot it in and push the tab back down. Easy. And after finishing with that side, the other one followed next. Now it's time to put the motherboard back into place. And uh, I realized I messed up. Looking at this connector here, I realized there's just no way I'll manage to reconnect it back the way that it is right now. So I had to remove the action button PCB I just put in. <sighs> what the hell is this connector for anyway? Oh, it's the camera. Alright, well, with the camera out, I can now connect it to the motherboard. 
As you can see, this type of connector does not have a locking tab. In this case, the cable is simply held in by friction. So to connect the camera, I simply push the end of the cable into the socket using the little protrusions on both sides. When reconnecting various shapes and size of components, it's important to find the best angle where you can both observe what's happening and have a good grip. Here you can see me connecting this fat cable to the motherboard. Having a camera right in front of my face does make the process of pushing the connector into the socket somewhat challenging, but the angle is good and I can easily see what I'm doing. Man, this camera's so annoying. The motherboard is not sitting properly, what the hell? Oh, okay. Um, but what about this side? Alright, now we're getting somewhere. Good. Motherboard is now in position and the action keys PCB can go back in again. And again with these damn cables. Okay, I think, I think I've got everything connected, or at least I hope I did. Time for a quick test run, so let's reconnect the battery. And now, the moment of truth. And it works. Well, for a couple of seconds anyway. I guess the battery's flat, so let's charge it up a bit. Okay, so the left analog stick definitely works. I can navigate through the items on the menu with it. But what about the right stick? Well, off camera, I found out that I can check the right stick without installing any games by using the web browser. Apparently you can use the joystick to zoom in and out. Oh yeah, check out that zooming action. That's excellent. I'm now reasonably certain that we have a fully working PS Vita on our hands. I did, however, end up checking that the camera works, just to make sure I reconnected it properly. And if I turn on the front-facing camera, you can even take a look at my lovely filming setup, completely free. Just pay separate shipping and handling. But we're not done yet. Before proceeding with the final reassembly, I turned the console off using the power button. This isn't exactly a Friday night situation, so no need to pull it out and rush. <laughs> the battery, that is. Next up, I tried to figure out where and how the not-so-obvious bits fit into place, starting with the silver trim. Well, it just clips in, so no problem here. What about the back camera, though? It looks kind of weird floating like this. Is it meant to go under the trim? Maybe? Anyway, the memory stick cover drops in place very easily, and so does the auxiliary connector cover. Next in the parts bin is... What the hell is this? Where the f*** is this supposed to go? Eh, I'll get back to it later. Now, I did repair a couple of other PS Vitas some long time ago, so I do vaguely remember these metal strips connecting to PCBs, and I'm confident this small rectangular one goes here. Same with the bigger rectangular piece. Oh, and also with this L-shaped special snowflake. No idea why I'm using the pink screws here, but whatever. They're all the same length and pitch, so it really doesn't matter. Okay, let's put the shoulder buttons back in now. This little black piece definitely goes here. But where's the other one? What about this again? Wait... Could it be? Holy shit, yes! Yes, we got it! There, this makes much more sense. The main problem now is I can't find the little piece to hold the other shoulder button in place. That's a bit of a problem. Okay, so since I couldn't find this little plastic piece anywhere, I assumed it's lost for good. Ideally, I would have gotten the proper replacement for it, but A, I don't have access to any other broken PS Vitas that I could potentially rate for parts. And B, even if I manage to order this specific bit online, 
I didn't feel like waiting for it to arrive. So you know what? I have decided to make a replacement out of some scrap. The shape is quite simple. The important bits are the two alignment holes and the hole for the plastic protrusion of the shoulder button to ride in. The thickness of this scrap piece of plastic that I've got is about right too. I assume the parts would have originally been symmetric, so I just mark the hole locations by using the part I still have. Next up I find a drill bit that's about the right size and get to business. I bet you're thinking to yourself, what the hell is this guy doing? There's no way this is gonna fit without any measurements. But you know what? <laughs> yeah, you're totally right. <laughs> I had to file the big hole a few times until it all started aligning. I then noticed that there is another pin that needs an alignment hole too. So I marked the location with my knife, you know, measure twice, cut once kind of thing, and made a slot in the plastic using a cutting wheel. Unsurprisingly, the slot I cut was way off, so I immediately gave up and just cut a big chunk out of the plastic. In reality, I bet it doesn't even matter. See, after a little bit of trimming, you can barely tell it's a DIY part. Measure never, cut whatever is how we roll here at the repair layer. Lastly, I found this little metal spring thing and I couldn't figure out where it goes. I therefore made the executive decision of leaving it out. I then noticed that I ran out of screws. I assumed the rest have been stolen by some evil fairies, so I was about to grab some spares and screw on the back as I realized I messed up yet again. The screws that I used to hold down the action and d-pad button PCBs, well, they weren't actually supposed to be screwed in from the inside. They're meant to go through the rear panel. As a result, I took them out and reused them in other places where screws were missing. Finally, I got the rear panel back in place, and after a brief wipe down, Look at what we've managed to accomplish. And there you go. This is how I ended up fixing and rebuilding a bag of parts back into a working PS Vita console. As you saw, there really wasn't anything too complicated and I guarantee you, most DIY repairs don't normally get much more difficult than this. Now mobile phone repair in particular is quite troublesome, so I wouldn't suggest you go tearing apart your latest iPhone with your newly found confidence after watching this video, but for many other types of electronic devices like cameras, games consoles, laptops, electric razors and toothbrushes or power tools, repairs are pretty much done exactly like what you've just seen. Once the thing is torn apart, you figure out what's broken, you get replacement parts, swap them in, and with a little bit of guesswork, just carefully put everything back together. If this video inspires you to take up more DIY repairs and hackery, which I really do hope it does, I'd like to give you some parting advice. Firstly, if you're repairing electronics, make sure that you're grounded and have not built up static electricity on your body. You can go touch a tap or a radiator or a grounding contact on some cables, like here on this laptop and discharge any static electricity before you start. Or, better yet, buy a grounding cable and wear it while you work. And also, don't wear things like bathrobes or woolen sweaters. Secondly, the one thing you really don't want to overlook is having a good set of tools for the job. If you take up doing DIY repairs at home to hopefully save some money, don't skimp on buying decent screwdrivers, tweezers, pliers, etc. Because by using cheap tools, you risk damaging your broken item even further. The tools will pay for themselves in no time. Lastly, don't be afraid to make things up as you go. See if you can come up with hacky improvised solutions to weird problems. Seriously, there's nothing more fun than repurposing some random garbage into materials for repairs. 
Anyway, I hope you found this video informative and entertaining. Thank you so very much for watching and I'll see you again very soon.